All right, well, thanks everyone for, uh, for sticking around. Um, we've got a, a little bit less time, but um, hopefully I'll get through it. Won't run through it too fast. Hopefully you'll find something mildly interesting um, about the presentation. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about today is a topic I've been looking at for a while. Uh, it's this issue of volatility or consistency of players. Uh, I've uh, done some past research on it and recently published an article in the Harbaugh Times looking at the consistency of game-to-game -game performance of hitters over the course of the season. Uh, wanted to take a look at the pitcher side to see if there was a way that we might be able to quantify this quality in a player um, and if there was a way to explain why some players may appear to be more or less consistent over the course of the season. Um, maybe it's an issue of makeup or maybe, frankly, it's an issue with just the way that they um, pitch. You know, could be we found with or I found with hitters, uh, guys with higher isolated slugging, um, high, higher isolated power were more volatile than guys with higher on base percentages. And so it just may be something structurally about their game that makes them appear to be more or less consistent. So the idea was to tease it out and see if we could apply the, the same uh, approach to pitchers and, and come up with a metric. Um, so the title of my presentation was going to be, and you see it in the program, quantifying the volatility of starting pitchers. After having gone through the research, I had to add this caveat, um, not completely sure I'm there. Um, but, you know, we'll give it a shot and we'll, you know, we'll see what I found. Um, also, I apologize, uh, since I got into town, I've been struggling with a cough, throat, voice issue, so my voice is kind of going out, in and out a little bit. Uh, because there's nothing really, I would say, very definitive about the findings of the presentation, um, I wanted to just maybe find another way to maybe get some joy out of it for you guys. Um, and I was thinking about, we've all sat through lots of presentations, both at this conference and many others, um, and it occurred to me that in the same way um, that, you know, Crash Davis tries to school and nuke Lelouch on the importance of cliches once you reach the major leagues, um, there's probably a whole bunch of cliches that we've all heard and frankly used when giving presentations uh, around our research. So I thought it might be fun for you guys to keep score of you know, the, the different cliches that I use today. Um, here are a couple of examples, some good ones. Uh, need to start somewhere. Right, that's when you hear uh, quite a bit. Not sure what to make of the results. Could go either way. Um, take the results with a grain of salt. I would emphasize that for this particular presentation. Um, the results are directional, but they're not definitive. Um, and then uh, finally, more questions. I'm um, sorry. There's more questions than answers. And then my all-time favorite, which I use all the time, lots more work to be done. So <laughs> keep score if you like. Um, so what are the motivating questions? Why, you know, what's really the focus of the presentations? I talked about um, really just wanting to understand, are there differences? Are there real differences in the volatility or the consistency of starting pitchers over the course of a season when we look at their games in total relative to the average they display at the end of the year? And if there is this difference, are there certain types of pitchers that appear to be more volatile or less consistent than others? Um, why study this topic, especially in baseball? Why even bother? Um, I like to say it's my unicorn. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the now classic uh, remake of Gone in 60 Seconds starting the great thespian Nick Cage, um, there's a line in the movie where uh, he's a car thief and there's this, I think it's a 69 or 67 uh, Shelby GT Mustang. Um, he's constantly trying to steal this car, and every time he tries to steal it, something horrible happens. He either gets arrested or crashes it. Um, he's chasing this, this mythical creature, can never seem to capture it. And for me, I feel like this topic of volatility is, is, uh, is that, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, and it's interesting, if I look back, the first time I published anything um, baseball related, I was writing for Beyond the Box for a couple of years ago, uh, which is a phenomenal site. If you don't read that uh, every day and read the great work by the authors there in the past, you're, you're missing out um, if you like analytics in, in, in the game. Um, but my first article there was actually trying to tease out this topic around David Wright. Um, I grew up a huge Met fan, I'm still a huge Met fan, and uh, there was a lot of debate at the time about whether or not David Wright was a streaky player or whether he was a consistent player. Could you count on David Wright every day? And so my first article there, I tried to tease this out. I don't know if I had a good answer, but it was an initial, it was, had to start somewhere. See, there you go. There's one point for the cliche. Um, Basically, I haven't been able to let the topic go, and so you've now got to suffer along with me here for 30 minutes. Um, but, you know, see, here's better reasons besides my own personal uh, you know, issues. Um, we know less about this topic, I would say, than other issues in the game. Um, for example, aging, or um, if we think about run differential and how that can explain, you know, teams' win-loss records and winning percentage. Um, people talk about it a lot. You hear 
managers, reporters, I'm sure we've all used this phrase about consistency or volatility to some degree about a player, but the extent to which we've been able to quantify it and really study it and know much about it, um, there's just been less written about it, and I think partially because it's a harder topic to dig into. Uh, there's also some evidence that volatility in run scoring and run prevention actually matters for teams. Um, some, there was some early work done um, at the Harborough Times on this topic, and, and I tried to tease this out a little bit at fan graphs. If you think about um, you know, run differential and the Pythagorean expectation is a good job of explaining how many teams, uh, how many wins a team should have over the course of the year, but there's always some variation, right? Some team outperforms by 10 wins, some team underperforms by 10 wins, and the question is why? And we know of a number of different things out there, right? Strong bullpens, good record in one-run games or extra inning games. You know, think about the Orioles a couple of years ago. Had a phenomenal record, I think it was, in, in one-run games and extra inning games, and they massively outperformed uh, their, their expected winning percentage. Um, there's some evidence that how teams distribute those runs throughout the year, um, that can also impact uh, how many games they win potentially above what they're expected to win. So it can have an impact on the outcome of, uh, of games. Um, and Sal, and I'm horrible with names, so I'm probably butchering this. Sal, if you're out there, I apologize. Um, uh, Baxa Musa, I think. Um, he showed that the increase in win probability comes, uh, becomes more marginal as teams score more than five runs. So he was looking at it from a run, um, a run scoring standpoint, and his point was, um, you know, if, there's, if, you're, if you've got, you know, X number of runs that you can score throughout the year, if in any one game you're scoring more than five, it's kind of suboptimal because the likelihood that you need more than five runs to win a game uh, decreases quite a bit. So there's, an, there's, there's potentially some advantage to being able to more evenly distribute your runs on a game-by-game -game basis throughout the year and therefore um, squeeze more wins out than maybe you would, uh, would be expected to. Um, I looked at this uh, at Fangrass, I think it was, I guess technically now it's two years ago, but late 2012, because this is a question I had. Could this be one explanation for why teams maybe outperform their, their expected winning percentage? There did seem to be some evidence that uh, run scoring and runs allowed, um, the, the volatility of those metrics was negatively correlated to total wins, so the lower your volatility, the more consistent you were scoring runs and preventing them. The, the, uh, the higher you were able, the more wins you were able to eke out above uh, the Pythagorean expectation. Um, now this was using an older version of the volatility metric, so I'm planning on going back and rerunning the study with some of the newer stuff. If the newer stuff is all that good, we'll see. Um, what was interesting though was run scoring and run, uh, runs allowed volatility were both positively correlated to, to wins above expectation. This was different than some of the research by, I think, David Gask uh, Glasgow and, and Sal as well at the Harbaugh Times, where it was thought that run scoring, the more consistent your offense is over the course of the year, that's a positive. You might be able to, to eke out a few extra wins, but that you actually wanted your runs allowed to be more volatile. Sort of the idea being, um, if you're going to give up 20 runs over two games, one game you should be giving up 19 runs, and the other game you should be giving up one. So you can guarantee that you're going to win at least one of those games, versus giving up 10 runs in both games pretty much a guarantee you're going to lose both. Um, so again, I, I want to rerun this to see if with the new metrics it works out, but potentially this is one of those additional little pieces of information that can help explain why a team was outperforming or underperforming uh, their expected win percentage. Uh, one more quick thing, volatility, as I'm looking at it, not the same as streakiness. There's sometimes they overlap. You could have a player that's very inconsistent that's also streaky, um, but you could also have the reverse. Um, streakiness is, looks more at the lumping of good and bad outcomes, one way you might be able to describe it. Um, so a player, you know, 20 games stretch, they're hitting, you know, 200, and then all of a sudden they go on a tear for two weeks, and they're hitting 500, they're slugging 800, they have a, and then they drop down again. That's more about streakiness. What I'm looking at more with volatility is if we look at the, um, how you distributed your performances throughout the year, how close do those, do those performances tend to sit next to your, the average uh, performance for the year? So this is really more about things like standard deviation, central tendency, things like that. Uh, as I said, I, uh, I won't touch on this too long, but I uh, developed the metric for hitters. Um, as Russell Carlton, who's not here, but again, a guy that you should always be reading if you're not. Um, gory math details, it looks scary, it's really stupidly simple. Um, the metric there just tried to look at the standard deviation of your daily performance measured by WOBA divided by your average WOBA for the year. And we, we raised it to a, uh, to a power there because it was, there were some odd correlations going on where good players were getting penalized for basically being good players with the volatility metric. Um, 
Uh, so I don't want to go too much into this. You can read the article if you're uh, all that interested. Um, what was interesting about this was when we looked at volatility, there was some evidence that players, uh, it was somewhat consistent year to year. So if you looked at a player's volatility or a hitter's volatility in year one, and then correlated that to year two, um, you're looking at about 0.4 correlation. Um, again, not the strongest in the world, but it's not nothing either. Uh, <clears throat> so some evidence that it's a repeatable skill. What did, what was apparent though is that um, much like something like batting average or BABIP, it's one of those statistics that it may just take longer for it to stabilize. So if you're artificially looking at a single season, 162 games, that might not be enough. But if you're looking at two or three years together, you begin to see some players that over the course of a longer period of time or a career, they seem more volatile or less volatile. So it may not be the thing that you can count on year to year being all that stable. Uh, high, vol uh, high volatility hitters tend to be high strikeout, fly ball, slugging hitters, whereas those that had lower volatility were uh, high on base percentage, um, high contact, ground ball types of hitters. Um, so what this said to me was, and part of the idea around pitchers as well was, it may be that when we see a player that we feel like they're just inconsistent, that they, you know, their performances tend to jump around a lot or they, they tend to vary quite a bit from, their, from who they are at the end of the year. Maybe it's something about their makeup, maybe they're not focused every day, whatever, but maybe it's also just something structurally about what their game is. Um, Matt Schwartz uh, had a great phrase, um, he was looking at the issue of clutch, where we, you know, we tend to say some players are more clutch than others, and he was looking at left-handed power hitters, where um, they, what would appear to be less clutchness was more a factor of when they're up at the plate in high leverage situations, um, you know, uh, like a guy like Ryan Howard, he appeared to be more clutch, but that's because the shift wasn't on at that point. Um, when the shift is normally on, he hits ground balls to the right side, they all get gobbled up. In high leverage situations, you probably don't have the shift on, and so he's hitting ground balls that now get through. It makes him appear as though he performs better in these clutch situations than others. Um, and so Matt coined that, you know, they said you could be structurally clutch. It may be that you could be structurally volatile or, vol or structurally consistent just based upon the nature of your game. Um, and I won't go into this. This was just kind of plotting if you're high, you know, high on base, high ISO, and kind of what the different levels of volatility uh, turned out to be. And you can see if you're really, really high isolated power, but really, really low on base percentage, you've got a really, really high volatility. If you are high on base percentage and, and uh, less power, you tend to have the best or the, you know, the most amount of consistency. And obviously within that big you know, data cloud, if you will, um, there's a lot of um, uh, exceptions. So Joey Votto, for example, High isolated, slug, uh, high isolated power, high on base percentage, and one of the most consistent players on a year-by-year -year basis. Kind of defies what the, the general trend looks like. Um, so again, volatility, is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary quite a bit on a player-to-player -player basis, at least how I've, how I've got it laid out now. Um, so let's talk about pitchers real quick, since that is the presentation. Um, there have been attempts to quantify this in pitchers, um, but again, nothing robust, nothing that has kind of you know, lasted uh, you know, for, for quite a lot of time. Um, David Gasco used I think, quality starts as a proxy for consistency. Um, he found that there was some uh, correlation in quality starts year to year, but when you adjusted for or controlled for ERA, that consistency disappeared. So again, kind of what we saw with, uh, with hitters, it's hard to have your volatility be the same year over year. Um, and this is where he laid out this idea that being an inconsistent pitcher may actually be more beneficial, particularly if you're a back of the rotation starter. Uh, Eric Simon used uh, the flake statistic at baseball prospectus. Um, it's one, frankly, I, I, one I wasn't as familiar with. Um, he, you know, he, he looked at it again. He found that there, it was kind of hard to explain. There wasn't a lot of consistency behind um, the volatility, the flakiness of, of pitchers. Um, and I briefly looked at this when I was uh, writing at Beyond the Box score. And my, the metric I came up with was pretty consistent with flake, which was a standard deviation based uh, type of metric. Um, the problem I kept running into when I tried to adjust for in this study is pitching creates a unique challenge to using a standard deviation type of metric um, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, one, hitters just generate a larger number of observations to study over the course of a season. So if you're looking at a game by game basis, you've got a regular hitter anywhere from 130 to 160 games over the course of the season. Starting pitchers, in this day and age, you're lucky if you get 34, 35, 36. So you're talking about five times the sample with hitters over the course of the year, um, which maybe makes that statistic a, a bit more stable. 
Um, the other problem is outliers. So when you've got a sample size that's that small, um, outliers can really you know, wreak havoc with anything you're trying to measure over the course of just 30 observations. Um, and you know, part of the problem too is with pitchers, as with hitters, there's an artificial limit to how low you can go, for example. So even the best pitcher can only have a, if you're looking at runs, uh, runs against or runs allowed in the, in the game, you can only have zero as the best performance. So there's kind of an artificial floor essentially on their performance. Hitters, same thing, there's only, there's only so bad they could be. Um, so that creates some issues with, with the metric. Um, and then third, it's not always up to the pitcher about how long uh, they perform in a game and how many runs they give up over the course of their outing. Managers, I, I say this, you know, they create the biggest problem just methodologically because um, you could be a pitcher that has the stuff to give up four runs over nine innings in a given day. Um, but if a pitcher uh, doesn't give up those four runs until, let's say, the eighth inning, um, they're likely to pitch longer in the game. But if you give up those four runs in the first two innings, you may not get a chance to pitch the rest of the game. So somewhat artificially, in some cases, pitchers get yanked out of games and they have very you know, highly inflated runs against per nine as a result in a game-by-game -game basis. And again, sample size is small. The outliers can really screw things up a bit. Um, so you know, had to start somewhere. Um, I could use the standard deviation based metric, but again, I, was f I did try this actually in the, in the rerun and the results just didn't look right. They were very, very uh, weird and you know, they didn't pass the eyeball test. Um, and again, as I talked about, you've got this interesting effect where there's this artificial distribution um, uh, from, uh, you know, this, and this is runs against per nine, runs allowed per nine where there's this big lump of zeros and then things you know, kind of go into a distribution and there's this long tail to it. So standard deviation can be kind of messy with a, a, a distribution like that. Um, the other option that I stumbled upon was looking at things like the interquartile range. So what's the difference between the bottom 25% of a pitcher starts for the year and then the top 25%? Um, there's other ways that you can adjust that to try to control for pitchers that have higher and lower um, runs allowed metrics. and so without getting too much into the, the gory details, there's this thing called the quartile coefficient of dispersion, um, which if that gets your blood pumping, great. Um, it's a little, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's a way of trying to control for the fact that you're going to have different pitchers with different medians or different averages and to try to make those interquartile ranges somewhat comparable with that. Um, so here's an example of why we might use one versus the other. Um, and this is, again, just as my research, kind of digging into some examples. Um, Buzz Capra, anyone familiar with Buzz Capra, 1974? Um, Buzz Capra, if I, and you can correct me, uh, but my, what I remember, he was a pitcher for the Mets. He was sold, I think, to the Braves after the 73 season. Not anything to write home about with the Mets, but then had just a ridiculous season in 1974 with the Braves. Um, he had a, 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 a you know, park and league adjusted ERA that was 40% you know, better than league average that year. Um, 27 stars had a bunch of relief appearances. Um, his runs allowed per nine was 2.8 for those starts. Um, so he had a really great year, but when you look at the data, he also had a couple of really wonky outliers. And um, so if you did the standard deviation method, he came out to be 271% um, of league average volatility that year. So he looked like, he had a phenomenal year, but it looked like his volatility was all over the place, that he was nowhere near his average throughout the year. But when you use this other method, this, um, this inter interquartile range, um, he still looks like he was volatile, but nowhere near as much. So I decided to do this study based upon this new metric. Again, give it a shot, see what you find. Cliche, cliche, cliche. So I looked at data from 2009 to 2013. I only wanted pitchers that had at least 20 games started um, in the sample, again, trying to get as much sample per picture as possible. Um, and I did look at two different metrics, um, one for runs against per nine, but then one for fielding independent pitching. So one is just looking at, you know, what does a pitcher give up in general in their outings, regardless of who you want to say is to blame. The other tries to isolate to those things that we, th we think are in, in more in the, under the control of pitchers, strikeouts, walks, home runs allowed. Um, I didn't place a limit on the number of innings when considering the starts. And this is one, again, I kind of went back and forth on. I know that you potentially have some outlier issues where managers restrict the number of innings a pitcher you know, pitches in. So if a guy only goes two innings and gives up nine runs, do we really want to include that because we know it can you know, be, have havoc with the, with the measurement? Um, on the other hand, if the guy was really pitching that poorly, that's exactly the kind of information we want to know. Is, 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 do I have the kind of guy that could go out tomorrow and pitch a shutout or go out and get absolutely shelled in the first two innings? That's a piece of information you might want to know as a front office, uh, front office personnel, manager, even a fan. So for this study, I left it in. 
Um, some interesting things to think about, which I think align with what we know. This is looking at it over a league perspective. Um, so you know, a couple of things here, the, uh, the volatility from a runs allowed perspective, there's a, a larger spread, not as tight of a distribution. Um, whereas with filling independent pitching, the distribution is much tighter in terms of guys that are high and, and, and low. So um, I think that jives with a lot of what we've seen um, you know, in, the, in the literature and in, in, in analytics in the past couple of years where there's probably a lot that happens with runs allowed per nine that are not necessarily in our pitcher's control, so there might be a whole lot more variation in volatility there. But when it comes to the things that they control, there's not as much spread. Pitchers do tend to have a little bit more control over that, and you don't tend to have a, lot, a, a wider distribution when you look at pitchers over the course of the season. Um, there's just not as much variation there. Um, you find some interesting things when you, when you use this metric. So for example, you can look at some differences in runs allowed in, in FIP, um, even just looking at a single player. So again, you're, you have to have Met examples come Met fan. Um, so, so Dylan G, 2013, 32 games started, um, pretty good runs allowed, pretty good FIP, uh, considering you know, he's, he's mid to back of the end rotation starter. Um, when we do the math on this, um, what we find is that from a runs allowed perspective, he was about 42% worse than league average, 42% more volatile, less consistent than league average when it, came, when it came to the runs allowed per nine. However, when we looked at his fielding independent pitching on a per game basis, he was much better. Um, he was about 35% better than league average. So here's the same pitcher over the course of the season that in terms of the runs allowed, looks to be a lot more volatile, but when it comes to the things that he controls, he was actually much more consistent. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, and this, I always caution this, just because a pitcher is more consistent doesn't mean that they're better. You could be a really bad pitcher and consistently be bad and be counted on to be bad every time you go out and take a mound. Um, you, could be, you, know, you could be a really good pitcher and be inconsistent, but more often than not, your performance is so good that, that that's okay over the course of the season. So again, volatility doesn't just equate with, or consistency that shouldn't equate with being good. You have to take into account how does this pitcher perform in general, what's their, their general level of talent. Um, here's a comparison. Again, if you think about how you might use this, here's contrasting um, both of these volatility measures between two pitchers that had pretty similar years. So if you think about Ryu from the Dodgers, Strasburg from the Nationals, um, both pitchers had a th uh, 3.0 ERA, 30 games started, roughly six inning pitch per game started. Um, their FIPS were almost identical. So you know, if we're trying to compare guys, they were pretty similar um, over the course of the year. Um, what was interesting was if you compare their volatility metrics, though, they look very different. So while well, at the end of the season, their averages look the same, um, Ryu had a uh, uh, runs against volatility and a fifth volatility that were basically 20% better than league average in 2013. Uh, Strasburg, however, was 18% worse and 7% worse on RA9 and FIP. So again, two guys, at the end of the year, their averages look to be pretty much the same, their production looks to be pretty much the same, but how they distribute that production throughout the year looks you know, quite different when you try to apply this metric. Um, again, grain of salt. Um, so some hypotheses. So if, if, we, if we do think we have a metric that shows that pitchers are more or less volatile relative to each other over the course of the year, could we explain why some guys are more or less volatile? Why are some guys more or less consistent, like we found with hitters? Um, so a couple of hypotheses. Um, one is, pitch, uh, it says pitch is great, should say pitchers. Pitchers with high strikeout rates will have lower volatility. Um, pitchers with high left on base percentage should have lower volatility. Uh, if you have high walks, you should have higher volatility. Again, the more guys you're letting on base, the more chances there are for runs to be given up. So the more that you kind of, um, you know, you're kind of playing with danger, you're playing with fire, as it were the higher likelihood that your performances look a little more volatile. The less, the less guys you put on base, the less risk you're at for giving up runs, the less likely you should be to see your performance vary. At least that, that was the hypothesis. Um, pitchers with uh, high home run fly ball rates should have higher vol. Uh, higher bat bip should be more volatile. And then finally, low ground ball to fly ball ratios should also be higher vol. And again, this was um, just based on some of the hitter research. So what did I find? Not at all what I was expecting or hoping to find. Um, so most of the, the variables here were, or four out of the six were significant from a statistical standpoint. The effect size are not that big. Um, you know, K percent, uh, left on base percentage and home run to fly ball had the biggest percentages. But again, if you look at these correlations, they're not huge. They're small. They're much smaller than what I found for hitters, for example, over the course of the year, where you could explain a lot more of the variance in 
um, the, uh, in their volatility by some of these, you know, these outcome or process metrics. Um, the other thing that was interesting was basically none of them were in the direction that I hypothesized, which is always a big win when you're a researcher. You feel good about that at the end of the day. Um, you know, so I was envisioning high strikeout patients should have lower volatility. Here it's saying, no, the higher strikeout rate, the more volatile you are. Um, same thing with left on base percentage. Um, same thing with home run to fly ball rate and BABIP, et cetera. So that's, you know, uh, disappointing to, to some extent. Um, so what to make of this? Um, relationship, like I said, relationships were significant. The directionality was hard to explain. Um, when you take it all together, it's, it's somewhat hard to decipher. Um, you've got, you know, high K and high left on base. Um, uh, actually, I should say higher vol. Um, but high home run to fly ball ratios and high bat bips were lower volatility. Um, and this is just odd for me as we think about, you know, you think about guys with high strikeout rates. Um, they tend to also be more home run prone, um, be fly ball pitchers, et cetera. Um, it was just hard to kind of make sense of, of the results. Again, in, in, in this is the, uh, you know, kind of where the research is right now. Um, pitchers with lower bat bips tend to strand more runners, not fewer. So again, you'd think that guys that are really good at not letting guys on and then preventing a lot of base hits, they would be at less risk for giving up runs and having, you know, really bad outings and having the high volatility. Um, so that was, again, lots of questions around that piece, but I also wanted to just look at, you know, with this metric, can we say that volatility for pitchers is a talent the same way that we said it might be for hitters, where there's some consistency year over year um, between how, how a hitter will distribute their performances? Um, yeah, not so much. Um, when I looked at um, both my old standard deviation based metric as well as the newer one, there's literally you know, no correlation year to year. Um, I, one of the metrics was consistent, um, or, or I should say statistically significant, but there's almost no effect size there. So that can be one of two things. Um, one is that we just don't have enough sample, that if we looked at this over a two, three, four year period and then correlated that to another rolling two or three or three, two to four year period, maybe there's some correlation, maybe there's uh, some consistency. Um, or it could be, be, frankly, the metric's a bad metric, which you've got to always consider. Um, the other possibility is uh, maybe volatility is more of a descriptive statistic. There's not a whole lot that you can infer about it. It just simply describes, look, in this particular season, this particular pitcher, he had a, you know, a lot of outliers in his performance and he looked pretty inconsistent. But there's no reason to think that that's going to be the case next year. It's, it's just a description. It's, it doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the pitcher or anything inherent about their skill or talent. Um, as I said, maybe it just needs more, the stat needs more time to stabilize. Um, and then, you know, there are also just maybe some things we can't really get underneath because inherently this is a very hard thing to try to measure, particularly with uh, starting pitchers. Um, it may be better to look at pitchers that are similar in other categories, like with the Ryu Strasburg type of comparison, where you're somewhat controlling more for their overall performance and just looking at where the difference is in terms of that volatility, how they are distributing the performances. Um, that's actually where I started with the initial research saying, look, there, is, there are some issues with how good a pitcher is and how volatile they appear to be, so you should use this metric more as a way of another data point when you've got two very comparable pitchers. So I care more about your strikeout to walk rate, I care more about your home run to fly ball ratio, but once I've got two or three guys that are similar, this might be one more piece of information that helps me to make a decision between two or three apparently equally as good pitchers. Um, but it shouldn't be the driving force behind making any kind of a decision. Um, or Occam's razor, the metric is just bad. Um, which it could be. <coughs> so to sum up, um, there does seem to appear to be some measurable differences in terms of how pitchers distribute their runs allowed and their FIP over the course of a season. Um, the, those differences are inter interestingly are normally distributed if you look at it at a league level, so that's encouraging, um, but certainly not definitive. Um, FIP appears to be much more consistent and have a tighter distribution than runs allowed, which I think is consistent with how we think about fielding independent pitching and runs allowed at a pitcher level. Um, However, the volatility metric is basically itself inconsistent year to year. So it's not clear how much it can tell us about how this pitcher will do in the future. Um, it does seem to stabilize if you look at a number of years. So I ran some averages and looked at um, you know, a pitcher's volatility over a three or four year period. And again, you do, see, you do begin to see some separation. There are clearly some guys that uh, have uh, lower, lower volatility and higher volatility. Um, but again, you know, more, work, more work to be done. Uh, looking at whether or not that is something you could look at over a two-year period that correlates to the next two years. Um, 
It's also not clear that volatility is structurally determined in the same way it might be with hitters. There really may be no clear relationship between, oh, you've got a high strikeout, uh, low left on base percentage guy, highly volatile. Um, one thing I might look at is, you know, instead of looking at the components by themselves, creating some clusters. Because again, you could have guys, um, you know, high strikeout guys can have very different statistics and performances in other ways. So it may be that there's certain clustering of pitchers and certain clusters uh, tend to be more volatile than others, but that's something to, to look at later. Um, so where do we stand? I'm not in love with the metric. Um, I think there's probably a lot of work that can be done with it. Um, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, the other thing is it could be that park impacts volatility much more so than, than, uh, than hitters uh, when it comes to pitchers. Pitchers only are going to start 30, plus, 30 odd games a year. Half those starts may be in a home park where a lot of these factors are more, more consistent. Then they go on the road and depending on the park, their RA per nine, for example, you know, if I'm pitching in San Diego for 15 games and then I go play, I you know, happen to play the, the Rockies you know, twice in their park and have starts there, that can really, it can appear to create some volatility where maybe it's just a matter of the park. So, um, something I want to try to control for going forward. Um, and I want to just thank uh, Vince Jarrett and I were talking about this, and he had talked about me trying to split the data by home in a way. I don't think it's the kind of thing you could do in a season because you're already dealing with barely any uh, data points as it is. Um, but if you looked at it over a couple of years, um, that might be something to, uh, that, that could be helpful to stabilize it, the, the statistic. The other thing is it could be a matter of mechanics. So maybe the volatility is not really about are you a high strikeout pitcher, low walk pitcher, et cetera. Maybe volatility is showing you a pitcher that, in it, for whatever reason, in a given year, their mechanics, the repeatability of their mechanics, that was off for the year. That was inconsistent game to game. Um, could be lots of reasons for that, um, one of which could be maybe they were injured. If you're struggling with an injury over the course of the year, um, there may be some games where the injury is nagging you less, and so you've got more repeatable mechanics. Other games, other stretches, maybe the injury is nagging you more, and so you um, are trying to compensate for that, and as a result, you have a more inconsistent performance than you would normally have. Um, Jeff Zimmerman and I were talking about this, um, so it's something else I might try to incorporate into this, looking at major injuries for a pitcher throughout the year, along with all this other stuff like strikeouts, home run rates, et cetera. Um, could also be there's no real good way around this inning pitch per game started issue, which tends to create lots of really wacky outliers, um, but we'll take a look. Um, and again, I talked about this earlier, you can have two pitchers that maybe on that day, if they're allowed to both pitch nine innings, they give up the same number of runs. But if, one pitcher gives those runs up very early in the game, they probably don't get the chance to, to pitch the rest of those innings. So it could artificially um, you know, sort of mess with their, their runs allowed. Um, bottom line, more work to be done. Um, thank you. I think we've got a few minutes. Uh, if there are some questions, happy to take them and probably not be able to answer them. Uh, we'll start here. We'll, we'll work back. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we'll start there, and then we've got, oh, we got the microphones. Okay. Uh, this, this might be long, might be short. Are you interested in the repeatability of his pitching statistics over a two-year period, one year to the next? Because I, I do have some data on that. For the, the, the outcomes, or the, like, the starting pitchers, uh, repeatability of statistics over a two-year period, one season? Uh, th that I have, I've got, I've got some correlations on what statistics are more consistent year over year. Um, I'm, what I would like to take a look at, I think, is you know, consistency from a mechanic standpoint. Um, and maybe some of the pitch FX data could be helpful here to see if the guys, you know, for example, their release point varies quite a bit start to start versus somebody who's pretty consistent year to year. Um, but I've, I've got some, some data around, you know, strikeout rates, walk rates tend to be more correlated year to year than, you know, half it. Okay, exactly. That's yeah. Worth, yeah. I have a couple of quick questions. Yeah. One is you talk about how pitchers tend to be more volatile, volatile or less volatile as you go three years and on out. Is there a possibility that the more volatile pitchers don't last for three years? And the second question is, is there any way to incorporate the concept of fatigue in your uh, data and, and maybe even forecast which pitchers can go so long without experiencing fatigue? And, and to control that factor a little bit. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, great point. So on the first question about, um, oh, darn it, what was the first, first question? It was about whether the highly volatile pitchers don't if they fall out. Three years. Yeah. yeah, so when I looked at the, the, the difference in volatility where you lose, use a blended average over three years, you still found guys that were highly volatile and, and low volatility. 
Um, so it's not that a bunch of highly volatile guys washed out because they were viewed as not being reliable or et cetera. Um, you still had, in, in fact, I don't know if I want to put this up because I, I don't even trust the data. Um, but let me show you this real quick. So here's your, R, this, is, this is where I looked at a blended average across, um, it was at least, it was either at least three seasons or four seasons. So this is a blended average of what their volatility looked like. So, you know, a lot of guys on here that you find, um, you know, kind of make sense, you know, James Shield, David Price, um, you know, you've got guys like, you know, John Lanning, Chris Volstead, Bud Norris, they're also seem to be, seem to be more consistent over that time frame. Um, but you also got these trailers, and so you still did have guys, um, you know, when it came to, like, you know, Brandon Morrow, Johansson, Tana Liriano, where they were, you know, 20, 30, 40% worse than those, this, that comparative set where these guys had pitched at least three seasons. So you, even amongst equal pitchers, you still did tend to see that variation. Um, but with anything, it's a good point, like with aging curves as well, there's a, there's a selection bias because a bunch of, you know, only certain guys survive and a bunch of guys kind of drop out. Um, so definitely something to, to consider. The, the second piece around fatigue, I think it's uh, exactly kind of where I'd like to go because if it is a matter of inconsistency of mechanics, potentially you can pick that up, at least the publicly available data, you could pick it up in pitch effects where you know, is a guy allowed to pitch more innings where their release point starts to vary more than guys that they're basically taken out right before their release point starts to vary, which could be a matter of being pushed with pitch counts or heat or, or whatever. Um, so, no, absolutely. And I think that may be a missing part of the equation of how you would explain why in a certain season one guy looks to be less consistent than the other. So, great point. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, Bill. That was very good. Enjoyed that. Um, did your work lead to uh, relief pitching at all as to why bullpens seem to be volatile year to year? And how would you assess that or how would you attack that? Yeah, I didn't look at relief pitchers because, well, there's a trade-off there, right? With many relief pitchers, you actually get many more data points across the season, right? You could get 40, 50, 60 relief appearances, doubling that with the pitchers. The problem is you've got a relief pitcher that comes in for a third of an inning, gives up a run, and their, again, their, their runs allowed just balloons, right? If you were to use something like a runs allowed per nine. Even FIP would, you know, goes ballistic because you just you gave, up, gave up a home run, and one guy you're trying to get out. And so I feel like it creates much more of this outlier issue. Um, that said, it may be another place to go because to see if the, the more data points I have might make it more, you know, reliable. Um, in terms of just the, the inconsistency of bullpens, I think part of it has to do with you know, the guys that tend to end up in the bullpen are guys that themselves are going to be less reliable. You don't know what you're getting with them, right? So these are guys that um, they weren't good enough to be starting pitchers. They probably only had one or two pitches. Um, on a year-to-year -year basis, I know Jeff Zerman and I did some work looking at aging curves, looking at starting pitchers versus relievers. And with relievers, um, their aging tended to be much harsher than starting pitchers. Um, their velocity tended to decline faster, and things like strikeout rate were almost identically tied to that. So it seemed as though from year to year, you could lose a mile or two on your fastball, and it has a much greater impact on your effectiveness than a starting pitcher that maybe loses a mile or two, but they find other ways to compensate for that. They pick up an extra pitch. They've got some of those secondary stuff that they can leverage, whereas a lot of relievers, they can make a, a, a good couple of years as a career of, I've got a plus 90s fastball and a, and a wipeout slider. But if one of those goes, now all of a sudden I become ineffective. So part of that, I think, may be tied up in it, but I, I'll, I'll see if I can do something with relief pitching. It's just going to be a little bit more I think difficult. Not that this was easy. This was kind of messy. So, uh, Bill, quick question. Hey. So, I, I not sure I saw, but did you account for opponent quality? I did not. Okay. So See, I mean, to me, that's yeah. probably 70, 80 percent of what the volatility okay. is from one from one game to the next, right? I mean, it's yeah. It. Uh, I mean, in war, we we account for try to account for opponent quality and actually you know incorporate that in there. I. I I, that also related to your high K percentage um, not correlating uh, to low volatility. It seems to me that high K percentage pitchers are more dependent on who the opponent uh, mm -hmm. they're facing is. So if they're facing better, better opponents, they're going to be less successful than somebody. And they may have more variability in that. Uh, to, it, they may be more sensitive to the opponent quality than somebody who's pitching to contact more often. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point. So again, there's a lot of these other factors that I think creep in and are going to be more pronounced with starting pitchers than you're going to find with hitters. And so whether it's, you know, the mechanics piece, whether it's the parks piece, but also the opponent quality, you know, trying to control for divi you know, divisional opponents, et cetera, um, that's definitely another one that probably should get worked in. Okay. 
be a correlation, picking up on what Sean just asked, mm -hmm. there may be a correlation to what you're looking at here with what Vince Gennaro has been looking at in connection with the performance of hitters against quality pitching versus non-quality pitching. And, right. Uh, an example would be uh, Chris Davis again. He didn't do so well against quality pitchers. He killed the bad ones. And you'd probably see that there was a lot of volatility that was correlated directly to that. Yeah, and that's why I'm so excited to keep doing this work because it's only going to get more complicated. So it's going <laughs> to um, Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, hey, Bill. Hey. Um, I'm a little unclear on your opinion on the desirability of volatility. I mean, you seem to have made a, a fairly clear case that if you're a good team, then you would want to be consistent because then you'd have a higher likelihood that your talent would be um, come out ahead of the, the lesser talents that you're more often playing. Um, if that's the case, wouldn't it not be true that if you are a below average team or a below average pitcher, you would be better off being more volatile. And I, as I'm yeah. looking through a lot of your work here, it seems to be that you're spending a lot of your time focusing on the above average angle and not so much on the below average angle. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. I, tr I had originally tried to tease that out a little bit in the one, um, one of the earlier articles looking at the team level because there was some debate about that, right? It's, it's not clear that um, more consistency would always be better. So if you are a team with a worse offense, um, if that offense, though, is, is inconsistent, meaning um, I'm going to have a large percentage of really bad low-scoring outings, but I also might get an equal percentage of higher-scoring outings, that might be better than always having this low average where I'm not giving myself a chance to win every game. It could also be that it's less about my offense in isolation and I have to combine that with um, my defense, my run prevention. So if I've got a really, really good run prevention, um, maybe the volatility of my offense doesn't matter as much, but if I've got um, a really bad run prevention, I, I may want a more volatile offense because I want more of those outlier games on the good side of the tail versus the games where I get shut out. Um, I don't know for sure either way. Um, when I looked at it, it did seem to appear that um, more consistent offense generally, even when, when controlling for the, the above average or below average aspect of, it, of the offense relative to the league, it still seemed to be better. But again, I, I want that was done with some older measures, so I want to go back and rerun that to see if that still holds. Because I do feel like it's going to be very interdependent based upon is your offense good or bad, then volatility might, you know, the kind of volatility that's good or bad could also be different. So it's a great point. I've got to go back and run the numbers again for sure. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Everyone, very much. Thank you.